This is an example of a site photograph. This is taken at the George C. Davis site in Texas in 2003, and it gives you a general idea of what was an archaeological context or a feature. Uh, it looks like feature 237.1. The interesting thing about this photograph is that it displays the invisibility of this site. Um, we did some geophysics and a lot of these features showed up very clearly and these were roundhouses. But when you excavate them, they are incredibly difficult to see. And this is further exacerbated by the fact that it was in red, very rich red earth and surrounded by very green pasture. And so I was an undergraduate excavating on the site, and I really felt that there was a change there, that there was something there. But then the grad students who I was digging with, they just really didn't believe me, and I had to turn over my trowel and go tap, tap, tap across the feature so you could hear it when I would tap, 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 and then would thud, thud, thud in the middle of it, and then it kept on going tap, tap, tap. And it turns out these two archaeologists were actually colorblind, and so even if there was something to see, there was very little that you, that you could discern in the red dirt there. Anyway, as you can see, this is a site photograph. You have a chalkboard that tells us what the site is, and a north arrow that also doubles as a scale, so we know approximately how big this one is. This is not the best archaeological photograph. Indeed, many of the examples that I use within this lecture are my own photographs, and so I don't feel too badly about critiquing them. You really shouldn't score out where you think the feature is. There's that distracting um, tape with the nails, but it might have been really the only thing that we could use to show the extent of what the site is. There are working shots, and so working shots are generally of um, a person, obviously working. In many genres of archaeological photography, the person's identity isn't necessarily completely um, obvious. Usually these people are turned away. And then so that you can actually focus on the fact of them as a worker and on the archaeological site. And this is uh, Katie Campbell, and she's working very well as a scale to show the, um, the footprint of a house that we discovered underneath an existing house during the Origins of Doha project. But again, while this is a so-called working shot, this is really relatively clean. Um, there are a few tools around showing that she is working, but um, the archaeological evidence is clear. Finally, there are artifact shots. This is part of the Bahrain Bioarchaeology Project, and I, again, critique this as it, all of these bones were covered with this very thick lacquer that then yellowed over the time that they were used within storage, and it was really difficult to get a good photograph of them because they were also shiny. So they're shiny, they're discolored, but I still tried to arrange them as the artifact might have been, um, as the artifact had not been through conservation, and it was likely a horn of some kind, so it would have been um, good to reconstruct the thing. But then why is photography important in archaeology? So we have site photos, we have working photos, we have artifact photos, but they're only one small part of visual corpus within archaeology. Again, we have site photography, so this is survey, buildings, aerial photos, excavation, structure for motion, and time-lapse time -lapse photography. Artifact photography, which is finds, you have x-rays, RTI, again, structure for motion, microscopic evidence, Finally, in which some people don't necessarily incorporate, is um, heritage or interpretation photography. So this shows the archaeological process. This can show experimental archaeology. They do a fine, um, they do a fine job at the Year Center with documenting their experimental ar archaeological process. And there's also re-photography, and you may have seen some of instances of these where you have an old black and white photograph, and then they're superimposed over the modern scene. It's actually really hard to do in York, as many of the black and white photographs kind of look very similar to what it looks like today. Once again, site photography, this is, um, these are record shots. This was to show a what might have been a feature in Diban, in Jordan. 
Um, again, you see the scale, you see the north arrow, um, and they're relatively clean, and they're set up so that you can see the most of the archaeological context, feature, or and whatever else around it that is important. So there are record shots. So these are of the archaeology, working shots, people plus archaeology, and personal shots, which I was showing earlier with the spider, people or animals. Record shots. Um, and so I like to use this as a demonstration of uh, taking a record shot. Uh, often you have to use a tarp to uh, cover what you're photographing so you can have even light, especially in very bright sunny hot places like where I like to work and so what I did is I climbed into this trench I took photographs of everybody holding up this tarp and then I took a photograph of the uh, pit it's only half excavated um, it wasn't even used really within the archive but we went to all this trouble just to make sure that the photograph looked all right and sometimes that is just how it is in archaeological photography these are record shots as well, so my record shot was not as uh, well done. There is a very gifted archaeological photographer named Jason Quinlan who has taken the majority of the shots at Chateauhuyuk. And this is a very beautiful series that shows, so you try to capture the entire context, and this is of a um, baby burial. And then a much closer up of this particular burial, um, so that you can see the important parts as revealed by the archaeologist in that there is some burning. And finally, this is kind of a, a pullback to show an entire building at Chateauhuyuk, uh, again with the scale, showing a extremely clean, extremely well set up uh, record shot to show a phase of excavation or occupation within the building. This is a, um, another shot that just shows the, a burnt pillar um, and some patterns of burning that some forensic archaeologists were later on able to use to determine what might have started a fire within this building. And this is an extremely close-up image of some very early cordage that was found. And so this is not actually quite as clean as the rest of the, the um, record shots that I was showing. Um, but it's because what the archaeologist was excavating was so delicate that it was really important to catch the artifact in situ as they were excavating it because through the act of excavation, they might have destroyed it. But I wanted to show you the incredible range of record shots that could happen. And obviously, these all have a scale. They all present their archaeological evidence as central and as interpretable and are very well cleaned. Again, record shots are immaculately clean, free from clutter, distractions. You don't see evidence of the archaeologists around. They have a scale, sometimes a north arrow and a photo board. If you have these things, uh, usually it's best practice to take a photograph with all the clutter inside, so the photograph, the, the photo board and the north arrow, um, and then clear it away and take a photograph of just the context. Um, the photo board is to tell you what it is of, but then the accompanying photo might actually um, be more revealing as it doesn't have everything else in the photograph obscuring what it is. So they're orthogonal. They're obviously they're shot at a right angle. They have very even light, so we try not to go for very harsh shadows within our, our record shots. They demonstrate an important detail of archaeological recording. And they usually don't have people in them, except sometimes a scale. And using people, as I mentioned previously, as a scale is, um, you can do it, but it can be very controversial. Uh, there are some stories of archaeologists using um, people, uh, only women, because they thought they were attractive, or using um, workmen uh, against their will. As I said, um, some people's religious beliefs do not um, allow them to be photographed that sort of thing. And so um, use people as scale um, intentionally and um, ask their permission. And there's usually no footprints um, within record shots. If you intend to do any um, 
archaeological photography, it's good to invest in a good pair of shoes that do not mark up the archaeology creeper soles. This is a very long quote that I'm not going to read, but it says um, it, that it is quite dangerous to completely erase the evidence of the archaeologists that were engaged in the archaeology uh, while we're recording the site. And this, I think, was much more of a critique in the 90s um, in that what before you have had digital photography, um, photography was a lot less used. It was a lot more set up. And it was a lot more expensive because you had to actually go through and develop all the photographs that you took on a site. And so if your project boss saw a whole bunch of photographs of spiders and all these other things that I was showing, they'd be like, why are you wasting our money? Um, but now that we have digital photography, I think this is a little bit less of a concern. What's more of a concern is the profusion of images that have come to characterize archaeology. So next we have working or process shots. This is Lizzie Hicks, who was an undergraduate a couple of years ago, working with me in the Origins of Doha project in Qatar. She wanted to get a master's by research search at Leiden, um, and is a very good student. But this is her uh, doing some illustration in archaeology. But again, as you see, it's a working shot. It's still very clean, and she's doing something that it, uh, is part of understanding the archaeology. Again, this is Ed Blinkhorn showing the origins of Doha project, um, doing some geophysical recording very, next, ne very near the Emir's Palace in Doha. Um, and it's good to show all of the different aspects of working within archaeology so they can show how you came to your results. And finally, Ruth Hatfield. Um, doing some building recording and the origins of Doha project. Again, while this is not entirely clean, it does show the working conditions and um, her engaged in recording. And this is again origins of Doha project at the Nuasia well site. Um, and this was part of an initiative to train Qatari archaeologists in recording their own archaeology. And um, you can see it is, again, very close up as they are um, recording this piece. Interestingly, though, as you can see, I knew the names of each of the previous subjects of the photographs. I was not um, involved in this process. Uh, um, this photograph was actually taken um, by the, uh, one of the other project directors. And so is it uh, a little bit iffy for me to be showing this of these nameless Qatari local men while showing the other white people who I know? Something to think about. Right, so in the selection um, from, of reading from today, um, I discuss some ways to understand archaeological photography and what it can reveal, as I just discussed. Um, if you Very often within working shots, you don't necessarily have eye contact with the person who's taking the photograph. This can suggest some objectivity. It can suggest that the person is very intensely focused and working very hard within, with the archaeological remains, um, whereas a eye contact um, it shows that the person is aware and is engaged with you photographing them and it gives a very different semiotic feel and it's you can sometimes uh, ascertain um, site relationships um, from this kind of evidence. So these are working process shots. They're still clean but they can show tools. They show the story of the project, how you came to um, the, your analysis, what you did in the process of your analysis. Reveal the process of investigation and have traditionally obscured the identity of the participant, and, but increasingly not so. And they show the greater context of the site, they can show working conditions, and they can also um, unintentionally reveal when the working conditions aren't so good or the archaeologists engaged are not um, very good at their jobs. So often you'll see working shots of somebody um, very delicately brushing something or um, 
doing some other slightly more passive things um, than, you know, whacking at something with a pickaxe or a matic. Finally, we move on to personal shots. And so these are, are quite common um, from uh, archaeological sites in that um, we were trying to uh, make shade for the archaeological photographer to um, take a photograph and our tent above us had a a uh, little break in the shade and so it was slicing right across the context so the phot photographer looked down took the photograph and then looked up and took the photograph of us um, looking very bizarre as we tried to shade our trench. This is a photograph of one of the uh, workmen in Dibon named Atif. Um, uh, we came to know each other quite well uh, while I was working there and so he trusted me finally um, enough to take his photograph uh, at a very um, close personal range rather than from the kind of semiotic distancing and so this is one of the photographs that we showed um, in our project but he was a really important part of the site and um, so I felt it was really important to include him and include him as show, showing him an active agent in the construction of meaning within uh, at Dibon. Uh, this is another um, site, uh, photograph at Dibon, and this is trying to demonstrate um, a terrible archaeological photograph. And so this is a wider shot that shows um, all of the mess and all of the rocks and the notes and the sample taking, um, wherein if you look in the very center of the photograph, you see the black and part that's been black and white or grayed out. That was actually the resulting photograph that went into the archive that did not necessarily show all this mess and clutter. So with modern photography and modern processing, we can very quickly turn a what is not necessarily an acceptable working shot into one that is. And this has been moved into a more artistic fashion. Um, this is a blog um, by photo, Photos Ephantidis, and I will include that in the links for this session. Um, and he likes to show archaeological artifacts, remains, excavations in a very much more artistic fashion. And it's, he's really pushing the boundaries of what we think of in archaeological photography. And so I really like to include his work because it's really important. Okay, so moving on to artifacts and analysis. Here are, here's a photograph of some of the potsherds that we found uh, as part of the Origins of Doha project. Note that um, photographic convention generally has the rims up um, or any decorations um, to be um, pointing up as opposed to this photograph, um, which was just a grab sample of things I was digging out of a well, none of which we kept, but I wanted to show the disturbance and the pieces of masonry and the pieces of pot and um, CBM that were present just to show the working conditions because um, the, this was not a secure context, but it was interesting enough that I took a very quick uh, grab shot of what was there just for a recording. This is a photograph of an engraved shell pendant from the side of Star Car, and they took an RTI photograph of this, which means that you can manipulate the light in viewing this artifact. I'll leave the, the links to this in the notes for this session, so I really encourage you to go and explore this for yourself as it has been used very effectively within this department for revealing traces on artifacts and gravestones that would not normally be readable um, but are very very visible with this technique. And finally this is a, an example of a very close-up uh, mi micromorphological reference of a feather and in showing that photography is also used on the micro scale in archaeology. Again, this is part of the Origins of Doha project, and so this is showing um, some 
uh, con conservation that is occurring. These kinds of shots are actually really useful because they show the process and the people of what is going on. Very often conservation gets left off of um, archaeological interpretation, but it is really a critical part of conserving the artifacts and, in the case of museums, displaying the artifacts. Finally, for interpretation and heritage, I used to make a series of photo comics, and so um, this was actually really useful in that it reminded me to take a photograph of each step of the process. This is some um, more experiential archaeology than experimental archaeology. It's making mud bricks for archaeological outreach. And so I intended to leave a document of what I had done so that other teachers or outreach uh, people could replicate it if they wished. This is another photograph of uh, heritage, and it is really critical that you get these kinds of photographs so that you can see um, students and other, the public interacting with your um, outreach activity. But note that um, the identity of all of these children is obscured, so you can't actually see who's um, taking uh, who is participating. And this is. Um, even more so these days, people are extremely touchy about um, you taking photographs of their children. And so very often it is best if you ask a teacher to take the photographs for you and then obtain permission from parents to use them. And even if the parents say that you can use these photographs and you can see, say, the kids' faces, it is best practices to still obscure their faces if you're going to use it in a conference presentation, if you're going to use it online, etc, etc. And again, um, at the Year Center, they've been doing really incredible photography of very, um, very close-up examinations of the process of creating artifacts through experimental archaeology. This is a photograph um, that you may actually recognize. It's been used in literature um, for the department. It is of doing the Heritage Dam, and in part I usually um, I like to include it because it shows how difficult it is to make um, computer work and digital archaeology look interesting. I'm not sure does this look interesting, but it does show a, it's a massive part of our process, but it is incredibly hard to photograph. And going back to uh, what I said about the profusion of digital photography, this is actually a um, chart from a few years ago created by Jason Quinlan um, to show the profusion of photographs that are taken at Chattel Hick. And this is in part because of structure for motion photography, which requires people to take photographs, sometimes hundreds, um, all the way around a site or an artifact to create a 3D model of this artifact. Um, it just, um, the use of this has just exploded and we really have to consider what do we want to keep for the archive, what do we want to perpetuate, and this comes with a cost. Um, the Archaeology Data Service located in the department, um, you can go to their website and actually cost in, so how much does it cost to forever archive five photos, 50 photos, 100 photos. Do we really want to try to forever archive um, 18,000 photographs? Yet best practices within SFM photography does require you to archive all of those photographs. So we've gone from this kind of profusion of digital photography allowing us to experiment and make artistic decisions all the way to thinking about, well, um, maybe we should actually try to circumscribe our archive a bit.